Is hyperinflation here to stay? That is the question that I will be tackling in this video for you guys. We're gonna be providing some definitive answers based on deep data analysis. And this is a super important topic for you all to consider because I know a lot of you out there, I see you in the comments, you're looking at buying a home, you're looking at buying an investment property, you might, you might even be thinking of investing in Bitcoin, stocks, or gold. And that decision-making process right now is really influenced by whether you think inflation is here to stay, whether the price increases that America has seen over the last three to four months, which have been severe, are going to continue going forward. Because if they are, the idea is you better buy now or else. So what I'm gonna do in this video is look at historical inflation rates across America. Then we're gonna look at specifically which items and goods are going up the most in price over the last year. And then we're gonna tie it all together by evaluating what the Federal Reserve is doing in terms of money printing and quantitative easing and how that might not actually be having the effect that you think it is on the inflation rate in America. This is gonna be a great video for you to watch if you're a prospective home buyer, real estate investor, or if you're thinking of getting into investing in Bitcoin or stocks. Let's get into the data, guys. And the first place we need to get started is by establishing some historical context on what inflation rates look like in America over time. And that's what we're doing on this graph. Where we're looking at the year over year percentage change in CPI, consumer price index, excluding shelter. So this is excluding rent and rent equivalents. And this is data tracked by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And over the long run, we can see that the median annual inflation rate is plus 2.8% from 1951 to 2021. So typically speaking, on average, we have some moderate inflation, two to 3% per year uh, on average. That's typical, it's actually uh, pretty good. It's a sign of a healthy economy if you have moderate inflation. But the big concern is runaway inflation and hyperinflation. You can see back in the 1970s, America was dealing with that, where we had year-over-year -year inflation in 1974 go to 12.6% year-over-year increase in prices. That means that the prices of goods increased by nearly 13% in one year. Absolutely crazy. That is not good for society. And then for most of the 70s, inflation was elevated, and then it went back up again in around 1980. We had another 12% increase in prices year over year. And basically, if you were alive in the 70s and early 80s in America, there's no doubt that you remember this period of, of hyperinflation and all the problems that it caused. And so we do not want to be going back into that realm. Now, let's forward, fast forward to the last 10 years or so. We can actually see that starting in 2012, year-over-year -year inflation rates were pretty low. They're around 1%, 2% a year. Actually, in 2015, we dipped into deflationary territory for a little while, bounced back up to around 1%, 2%. Then we had another deflationary dip in May 2020 with all the COVID uh, situation going on. And then now we return to June 2021. 6.8% year-over-year increase in inflation in June, and this is a really high level. The last time America saw this spike was in July 2008, and before that it was 1990, November 1990. So what we're seeing like kind of like a once-in-a-decade inflationary spike here in America, and the central question is, which I'm going to help answer for you in this video, is is this inflationary spike going to sustain itself and potentially keep going up just like it did in the 70s? Or is it going to bounce back down just like it did in 2008 and 1990? That's what we're going to really be tackling in this video. So to properly answer this question, we really need to start with the basics. Like the basics as in what is inflation? Actually, what is inflation? Because I think there's a lot of people that have a misunderstanding about what inflation is. I see some people saying that inflation is printing of money. And I see some people saying, oh, inflation is when like gas prices go up. But really what inflation is, is when there is a sustained, long-term, broad-based increase in prices. A sustained, long-term, broad-based increase in prices. So what that means, sustained. Sustained means over a significant uh, period of time probably more than a year. We need probably more than a year of price increases to say we have sustained price increases. And then broad-based means that we're not just seeing price increases in certain segments of the economy and certain goods and services. We're seeing price increases across all goods and services. So that's what broad-based means. So um, what, what people are really concerned about right now is that we're going to enter that broad-based sustained increase in prices. And that's exactly what we had in the 1970s. And it's at this point, I think it's important to consider and ask the question, in the last year in America, you know, with our, with our big price increases, where is it occurring in the economy? 
what goods and services are seeing the biggest increases in prices and are affecting your purchasing power in wallet and pocketbook the most. And what's great actually about the BLS inflation data is that they track not only you know, the general inflation number, but they actually track inflation in specific goods and services across the economy. And on this list, we're actually looking at the year over year price increase in almost 250 different specific goods and services from pre-COVID times to current times as of June, 2021. And we can see here right at the top that there's three things that stick out like a sore thumb in terms of how much the prices have gone up. Car and truck rental. So if you go to Hertz or Enterprise and you want to rent a car, the cost of renting a car has gone up by 52% from pre-COVID times. So that means if you were normally paying $200 for your car rental over a couple of days, now you're paying $300. And that's a significant surge in prices. This is, of course, related to the fact that the prices of used cars and trucks are now 32% higher than they were before COVID. So if you have a, a used car that maybe you would have bought for $20,000 before COVID, you're probably spending something like twenty six dollars or $27,000 now on that used car or truck. Additionally, you can see we have laundry equipment, which has gone up by 27%. New motor vehicles have gone up by 15% major appliances up by 12%. So we can see that a lot of like big durable physical goods, the prices have increased a lot. Additionally, uh, there's a lot of meat on here. Uncooked beef steaks have gone up by 13%, pork chops by 12%, bacon by 10%, beef and veal by 10%. In addition to durable goods in meat, there's been a big increase in the cost of energy. So we can see propane, kerosene, and firewood has gone up by 12.5%. Utility piped gas service costs have gone up by 12%. Fuel oil has gone up by 9%. Gasoline has gone up by 9%. So there's really these three segments. It's heavy durable goods, it's meats, and it's energy, which are seeing the biggest price increase. If you're enjoying the content in this video and you wanna see more of it going forward, I ask that you just hit that like button. When you do that, when you hit that like button, it gets me more exposure on YouTube. And when I get more exposure on YouTube, it gives me more resources and time to devote to putting this content out. And in fact, I actually have gone from doing two videos per week to three videos per week over the last month due to your support. So just hit that like button. Also make sure to leave a comment. I wanna hear your thoughts on inflation, your thoughts on the housing market, your, your thoughts on the stock market. Let me know what you think in the comments. All right, let's get back to it. Now, if we scroll down this list, we can you know, get an even greater sense for how detailed uh, the BLS inflation data is. I mean, you can see we have like jewelry and cigarettes and frankfurters and fresh whole milk and shipping fare and distilled spirits and all these different things. So there's so much detail here, but we can actually see that the average item or the median item has gone up in price by 2.9% on an annualized basis from pre-COVID levels. And so that's important to think about. So the general inflation rate is 6.8%, but the typical item has gone up by 2.9%. And what that's saying is that the average inflation is being dragged up by those items at the top that we just talked about. So the fact that like car rentals and used cars, laundry equipment and meat has gone up by so much, it's dragging up that average inflation number when a majority of goods actually aren't going up in price nearly as much as that 6.8%. And as you scroll down this list, it's actually kind of interesting. I mean, there's quite a few goods where prices really haven't gone up. Eyeglasses and eye care, prices are the same. Bananas, prices are the same. Frozen and refrigerated bakery products, prices are the same. Pet food, prices are actually slightly lower. Toys, prices are slightly lower. Men's shirts and sweaters, prices are 4% lower. Women's apparel prices are 4% lower. Um, airline fares are 7% lower. Men's suits are 13% lower. So we actually have quite a few goods that not only are they not going up in price, they're actually going down in price from their pre-COVID levels. So we're really seeing inflation in three specific areas right now. It's cars and major appliances, it's meat, and it's energy. Those are the things that have really gone up in price the most from pre-COVID levels. And the reason a lot of those things have gone up in price is because of supply chain shortages, right? Especially related to cars. There's a chip shortage. We can't produce as many new cars right now. And as a result, even though the, I don't think the demand has really gone up that much for cars, we simply don't have enough cars. And it's a supply side issue. And as a result, the cost of cars is going up and the cost of renting cars is going up. And really what this says is that we're not seeing 
the broad based inflation yet. We're seeing this kind of supply side inflation in specific goods, but when you look at something like apparel and clothes, that is cheaper than it was pre-COVID. And so to me, what would be the indication of broad based and true inflation is if we actually start to see the price of something like clothes go way up, something where there hasn't really been a supply chain shortage. If all of a sudden clothes are five, 10% more expensive than they were a year ago, then you really need to start being concerned about inflation. But I think at this point, we need to link this to the Fed, the Federal Reserve and what they're doing. But I think a lot of you guys are already saying, you're watching this and you're saying, all right, I understand that maybe we haven't quite hit true broad-based sustained inflation yet, but we will because the Fed has printed so much money and it's just inevitable that inflation is gonna occur. I think that's what a lot of people think. And we really need to understand what the Fed does when they quote unquote print money. They do this through their quantitative easing program. And this was a program that the Federal Reserve never really put into place until it was 2008 was the first time that they did this uh, in response to the great financial crash in 08, 09. And what quantitative easing is, is that the Fed simply says to commercial banks, they'll go to JP Morgan or Bank of America, and they'll say, hey, commercial banks, you guys actually own some US treasuries, some US bonds, and you also own maybe some mortgage-backed securities. We're gonna give you cash for those treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, and we're gonna take those treasuries and mortgage-backed securities from you. So it's an asset swap. The Fed gives the banks cash, the banks give the Fed treasury, uh, treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. But we need to actually fundamentally understand what happens in this transaction. The Fed gives banks cash. The Fed doesn't actually put cash into the economy. That's an important thing to remember. The Fed actually has no power to helicopter money into the economy. They do it through banks, and then it's the bank's responsibility to then go and put that money into the economy. And what we're looking at on this graph is uh, the amount of cash assets and credit held by commercial banks in America. And so when I say commercial bank, think of JP Morgan, Bank of America, Credit Suisse, big banks, how much cash credit they have. Um, and this is a, a statistic where you could see that for most of like the last 50 years, banks had very low levels of cash credit because why, why would they wanna hold excess cash, right? If a bank's holding too much cash, that means that they're not making money off it. They could be loaning it out or investing it in a, in a security with yield, so they, they don't wanna have too much cash on hand or cash with the Fed. And then we could see that starting in 08, all of a sudden, that cash credit amount spiked to 1.1 trillion and then it went to 1.7 trillion in 2011 and then when it went to 3 trillion in 2014 and this was in response to the fed's initial rounds of quantitative easing in uh after the last financial crash the fed once again said to commercial banks give us your treasuries we'll give you cash and as a result the cash credit amount that banks had went to 3 trillion so this was essentially, you can interpret this as saying the Fed created $3 trillion in cash over six years. That cash balance started going down from 2014 all the way to 2019. It went down to $1.6 trillion. That was a result of a stronger economy. Banks all of a sudden said to themselves, hey, stronger economy, we're more confident, we can lend this cash out. It was also a result of some quantitative tightening that the Fed was doing. But then, right when COVID hit, this cash credit number spiked all the way back up to 3.9 trillion. So since COVID, the Fed has created 2.3 trillion in cash that's now sitting in bank reserves and bank vaults. And the whole idea here from the Fed's perspective and the mainstream perspective is that when you give banks cash, they're then gonna loan that cash out. And that that's a stimulant for the economy, it's gonna keep interest rates low, and everyone's gonna be bullish and everyone's gonna take risks. But there's a problem with this. And the problem is, what you could tell from that graph is that the cash largely is just staying in the bank account. The Fed gives commercial banks cash and expects those commercial banks to loan it out, but they're not really loaning it out. They're just sitting on the cash. And this is where the whole Fed helicoptering money, QE is gonna cause crazy inflation starts to break down. Because once again, the Fed has no power to just inject money into the economy. They have to give banks money and those banks then need to inject that money into the economy. And if the banks are just holding on to the cash reserves, that's not inflationary. If the money is just sitting in a bank vault, not being loaned out, 
not being put to any use in the economy, not increasing the velocity of money in the economy, there is no inflationary element to that. And in fact, this whole program of quantitative easing could actually be having the exact opposite effect. But since 2008, when quantitative easing was first implemented, banks have become extremely risk averse in terms of making loans, in terms of expanding credit. It's in, in fact been the exact opposite thing that's occurred since the Fed has started their quantitative easing program. And you can see that outlined on this graph where we're looking at the year over year increase in loan credit, the amount of loans that commercial banks are putting out there, year over year increase over the last 50 years. And what I did is I kind of segmented this graph between the period from the 1970s to 2000s and then basically from 2010 to today. And we can see by this yellow dotted line that the average year over year increase in loans from banks from 1970s to 2000s was 8%, an 8% increase a year. And we can actually see going back to the heavily inflationary times of the 70s that it was around 18% increase a year in loans. But then if we fast forward to the last 10 years, we can see that this increase in credit expansion and loan expansion has declined significantly. We're talking about 3% year over year expansion, 3% year over year expansion. It got up to eight for a brief period in 2016, then dropped back down to 4%, 4%. And now actually through early July, 2021, we actually have a reduction in loan credit from commercial banks year over year not an expansion. And this is super interesting because a lot of people think that inflation is, is upon us, right? And if you go back to the last inflationary, big inflationary period in the 70s, banks were loaning money like crazy, increasing their loans. And that makes sense for a true inflationary period because if true inflation is here, banks are gonna wanna lend. You're not gonna wanna hold cash if there's true inflation. You wanna put that money to work and earn a return on it. And that's exactly what they were doing in the 70s. That is not what banks are doing right now. Banks seem risk averse and cautious over the last 10 years in general, and then especially over the last couple months. And so long as banks are risk averse and cautious and stockpiling cash and not really loaning money out inflation, it's gonna be very difficult for that to happen. Because again, remember, banks are that link between the Fed creating the money and that money getting into the economy. Banks have to lend it. And if they're not lending it, then it's not inflationary. And in fact, the behavior of these banks is actually indicating a deflationary environment. A deflationary environment is, goes along with people feeling scared, people feeling risk averse, people feeling like they don't wanna make loans or they don't wanna take risks, or they don't, don't wanna make big moves. And that's exactly the situation banks are in right now. And a great anecdotal example of this is JP Morgan. About a month ago, JP Morgan CEO, Jamie Dimon came out and said basically that uh, despite, despite the inflationary pressures, JP Morgan was just gonna stockpile cash because they expected interest rates to rise. And this is super interesting. I'm gonna show you an article real quick. And so here we're looking at an article from CNBC and we see here, uh, Jamie Dimon says, JP Morgan is hoarding cash because there's very good chance inflation is here to stay. And so let's just look at some quotes here. JP Dimon says, we have a lot of cash and capability and we're going to be very patient because I think you have a very good chance inflation will be more than transitory. He goes on to say, if you look at our balance sheet, we have 500 billion in cash. We've actually been effectively stockpiling more and more cash, waiting for opportunities to invest at higher rates. So stockpiling cash, think back to that cash credit graph I showed you, right? Where the amount of cash credit the banks had kept going up. And so this is really curious, right? On one hand, Jamie Dimon's saying we expect inflation and higher interest rates, but then he's saying we're stockpiling cash and not making investments because we're gonna wait for that to happen. That's a bit of an oxymoron because for inflation to really occur, you need some belief in growth. You need some lending to occur. You need some risk taking. And if banks are just gonna say, I'm not taking risks, I'm waiting, we're gonna, we're gonna hoard money, that is a deflationary behavior pattern which is essentially gonna prevent inflation from occurring. And so no guys, I don't think hyperinflation is here to stay. I think it's transitory. And it's not just me thinking this, it's also the bond markets in the currency markets. If you look at the 10 year treasury yield, right? The amount of yield and return that people are demanding to own US government bonds, the US treasury yield has been going down consistently over the last three months. That means more and more people are demanding and buying treasury, so they're accepting a lower return. 
why would people be demanding treasuries and accepting a lower return if true sustained broad-based inflation is here to stay? Uh -uh. That's, again, a deflationary sign that people are piling into a safe and secure asset like U.S. Treasuries. It's not a sign that the market and institutional investors believe inflation is here. Additionally, if you look at the currency markets and the U.S. exchange rate against other currencies, the U.S. dollar is still very, very strong compared to its historical average. So to summarize all of this, we do have a big short-term spike in inflation. The 6.8% year-over-year CPI increase in June 2021 is historically high. It's about a once-in-a-decade inflationary spike. However, that inflationary spike is not broad-based at this point. It's concentrated in specific segments of the economy, uh, goods and services related to cars, major appliances, meat, things like that. It has not spread to other parts of the economy like, let's just say, something like bananas still cost the same amount. Clothes cost less than they used to. So we don't have broad-based inflation yet. And the reason we probably don't is because the underlying financial system in banks are not lending the money that the Fed is printing. The Fed is quote unquote printing this money, but in effect, they're just giving it to banks into their bank reserves. And that money is just sitting there. It's not getting loaned out. And we can see kind of quotes from people like Jamie Dimon saying, hey, we don't even have, we don't even have plans to loan this out. And as long as the environment is that way, it's gonna be very difficult for inflation to occur. And then we can see this backed up by what's going on in uh, the bond markets with 10-year treasuries with yields declining, and then currency markets with the DXY still being above its long-term historical average. So what does this mean for you if you're looking at buying real estate or Bitcoin Bitcoin or gold or stocks right now. And part of that strategy is using these assets as an inflation hedge. Well, I think it means that you got to second guess the whole notion that we're going to have runaway inflation because it doesn't really appear like the fundamentals are aligning for an inflationary environment. And that doesn't mean it's definitely not going to happen. It just means that a deflationary environment is also as much a possibility. So you need to weigh these things in your decision-making process and not just blindly believe into the kind of hype narrative that hyperinflation is here and it's going to continue. Because looking at the data, it doesn't really point to that being the case. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I come out with two to three videos per week on real estate, and I'm going to start doing some more financial related videos as well on topics like inflation. If you're enjoying this content, make sure to hit the subscribe button. You're not going to want to miss these future videos. Additionally, make sure to like the video. If you already liked it, don't undo your previous like, but uh, in case you haven't liked it, like it already. That gets me more exposure, helps me produce more of these videos going forward. All right, guys, until next time, this is Nick from Reventure Consulting signing off. Oh.